everyone, my name is Jenna, but you guys can call me Jen, and welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you're new. Hi, hello, welcome to the series series if you are new here. My series series is where? Is a, is a little series that I've cooked up on my channel. Let's see how many times I can say that word. <laughs> I cooked it up basically because I have had a terrible problem my entire life where I just honestly cannot finish series. I just read a first book of a series and then continue on with my life and never finish it, never go back, no matter how much I love that series. So this past year, I have set out on a little bit of a journey to change that and actually finish some series that I've started out of the 90 plus series that I've got going on right now. And today we're gonna to be starting number five of the year, the very last one of 2023. We are going to be doing the duology by Shelley Parker Chan, She Who Became the Sun, and He Who Drowned the World. Now my whole thing with this series, 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 is that I reread book one, so I have previously read She Who Became the Sun, and I am so excited to reread this. I've actually been reading it currently. I am 62 pages in and it is currently 2 a.m. So I need to go to bed. But the whole thing with this series is that I reread book one and then go all the way through to the end. If you've seen my other videos, we have The Poppy War. We have The City We Became by N.K. Jemisin. And I just recently finished literally today. I am in the same outfit and the same hairstyle literally like 30 minutes ago. I finished City of Brass or the David Bad Trilogy by S.A. Chakraborty and it was such a great time. And that was that was number four but now we're going into number five and it's this lovely duology that I am so excited to end the year with. I'm, so, I'm honestly so pleased to be back in this absolute utter masterpiece. And to continue with the sequel that came out this year, I've heard only good things about this and I'm ready for my world to be rocked. I'm ready for my world to be destroyed by these masterpieces of literature. So I'm very excited and I'm, and I'm ready to go. But yeah, I am already 62 pages into book one because I wanted to dive in. And as you can kind of tell, <laughs> the last time I read this, I tabbed it up like crazy. I really, really enjoyed this. I think I gave it four and a half stars. It was one of those books that was like, I recognized it was a masterpiece. And it was also part of the like core sapphic trifecta. I believe I read this when I was doing my vlog on the sapphic trifecta with uh, the Unbroken and the Jasmine Throne as part of it. This was my second favorite of that video because the Jasmine Throne became like my favorite and I love that book so freaking much. This genuinely masterpiece. And I kind of knew back then that like it would probably get even better upon reread. So I could not be more excited to be rereading it right now and then continuing with the story into the next part. Because I remember getting to the end of this book and just being like, oh man, like you can just tell that the story will not stop its awesomeness and its intensity. So this follows the story of a young girl who at the beginning of this has no name and she's extremely poor. She's living through a famine and a drought with her family or what remains of her family, her father and her older brother, Zhu Chongba. One day, a couple of rebels come by and they basically beat her father to death because he doesn't give them everything that they do have, but really all they have are two jars of beans. And within a few days, her brother dies as well because he has no will to live. Before this, very important factor, is that her brother on his birthday, his 11th birthday, his father took him and and the girl, because the girl just, you know, came along, and her father took her brother to a fortune teller and asked the fortune teller to tell him of his son's fate. And his son's fate was something of pure greatness. Once her father and then her brother dies, the little girl, is there burying her brother and her father and thinking to herself, well, if my brother has decided, has chosen to become nothing, has taken my fate of becoming nothing, why don't I take his fate? So she decides to christen herself Zhu Chongba, pretend to be a boy and go to the monastery that she knows her father had promised her brother to go to when he turned 12. And she just wills herself to survive. And then it's the story of how she just becomes awesome. <laughs> and she takes this fate that was meant for her brother and uses it as her own. 
It is a fantastic, a fantastic narrative of resilience and gender and trying to defeat heaven and stay out of heaven's eye, but also still becoming great without heaven like noticing. It's got, it's so great. Like it's, I remember saying something about it back back in the day. Like it's based on a on like history and the story of one certain historical figure. But my friend told me that that was spoilers, so I won't say that to you guys. <laughs> so as you guys know, I like to keep my video in this at least a little bit spoiler free and I will warn you if I do talk about spoilers with these books because sometimes I just can't help myself and I need to scream with you about how amazing something is or scream with you and how disappointing something is. So buckle up, gather yourselves, gird your loins because we're reading She Who Became the Sun and He Who Drowned the World. And I am so excited to finish this duology. Oh is it called The Radiant Emperor? Is that this what this duology is called? I'm very excited about it. None the less. Truly. I just... Mm. I'm so excited. Anyways, I will catch up with you when I'm about halfway done my reread of She Who Became the Sun to let you know how it's going. Then, once it's done, I will dive into this bad boy. Several days later. I totally forgot to update you for the entirety of She Who Became the Sun, didn't I? I am. <laughs> On page 230 of He Who Drowned the World, and I was just sitting here like, I don't think I updated the vlog. <laughs> Oh my god, I am so sorry friends. Hello, it is a few days later. I'm done, he's she who became the sun. What a reread. Oh my god. The first time that I- that's my book light, by the way. <laughs> I've been using it to do some embroidery because I just finished another present for my parents and I'm going to put some cloth on the back so that you don't just see string <laughs> in a moment. But another Christmas gift, done. Very happy about that because today is just the day where I'm trying to finish as many Christmas gifts as I can. I have two more to do, so <laughs> fingers crossed I can get that freaking done. I ended up rereading She Who Became the Sun mainly through audio because I've been doing a lot of crafty stuff this Christmas. And because it is officially December 22nd today, I have like two days left, not even, to get my life together for these last few presents that I need to do for Christmas because I'm gonna be at my parents on the 24th and I think I'm gonna be seeing my friend tomorrow potentially so that might wipe Saturday night off of my ability to do things so today tonight I am hopefully going to just bang out both of the embroidery things that I needed to do <laughs> so fingers crossed that I can do that anyways but because I've been doing so many crafty things and having to do like different Christmas gifts like that, I've been listening to the audiobook of She Became the Sun, which was a very different experience than when I read it in the tandem way that I usually read books in. And the first time I read She Became the Sun, I read it with audiobook and with the physical book in front of me and I was annotating and just really engrossed in it, catching all these little details and like really sinking my teeth into it. But the second time around, I knew the story, but there were still things that surprised me, of course. I knew the story well enough, so I was just kind of coasting through with the audiobook. And I think because I let myself kind of coast over a lot of the details, I got, I feel like I almost got like a different experience, a different story, because there was a lot of little nuanced things that I caught when I was reading it physically with the audiobook, of course, tandem reading it, versus when I was just listening to the audiobook. Which is so interesting to me because I love audiobooks. I have read the, like 80% of the books this year that I have read with an audiobook because I have trouble reading just with my eyeballs sometimes. When it comes to like thicker, denser fantasy like these books, audiobooks are my savior. But I find it so interesting that it was a different reading experience, even though I have previously listened to the audiobook before. I just, I feel like I got more of a, just more of a complete wash of a story versus like getting the little itty bitty nuanced bits that kind of slowed me down the first time that I read it. And I'm not saying either is a better or worse way of reading it for me because I know the story and I know the nuances that I missed quote unquote the second time because I was listening to it and like focusing on crafting stuff as, as well. But what an interesting little thing. And I also think because I know the story, the reread just was that much better. I don't know because it was one of those things where I was like okay I could simultaneously go without rereading this and just go right into the next book which is very rare that I find that. I think it happened as well for the the city we became partway through that reread I was like okay I could do without this now like I could just I just want to get to the next book like I'm not enjoying the read as much with the with the first with the reread but that wasn't the case with She Who Became the Sun. I feel like I'm not making any sense at all. <laughs> 
The case with She Who Became the Sun was that I was enjoying the read a whole heck of a lot. I really enjoy the craft and the mastery that Shelley Parker Chan has in their books. Like, they are an absolute master of an author and I cannot wait to see what they end up writing after this duology because it's insanity, the craft and the mastery and just the little nuances things that are carried throughout these stories. And yeah, it's kind of like a retelling, a reimagining re of some of the events in, in Chinese history, but it's just, it's bafflingly good. <laughs> and this reread, in my head I was like, I could just skip forward because I remember all this stuff and I could just go on to the next book. Like the reread, like missing out on the reread wouldn't be that bad for me. But I'm also really enjoying this reread. And by the time I got to the end of that book, the events that happened right at the end of She Who Became the Sun, which I won't spoil, the events that happened right at the end of it made me immediately want to pick up the next one, which I forgot that that was how the book made me feel when I first read it. Of course, because I read it a number of years ago, this sequel wasn't out yet. So I couldn't read the second one. And I'm so glad that I could this time. I just dove right into it. I, as is evidenced by the fact that I didn't update you at all. I am now like over 230 pages. That I'm in, I'm over 200 pages in. I'm on chapter 12 and ugh, I just couldn't put, I couldn't not. Like, I think I finished the first book and then I was like, yeah, I just want to get into the second one. And I have not felt that in a really long time with reading books. I'm done. She Who Became the Sun. Upon reread, it is a four and a half star, which I believe is what I rated it the first time. So we love that. We love to see it. Stayed the same rating. Still mastery. Still wonderful. And it still got me in some moments. And then this one, my man Ooyang. <laughs> He is in so much pain in this. Definite trigger warnings for self-harm and sexual assault and rape throughout this. I think this book is definitely more sexful, but not in the way of like a smutty romance book or a where a fantasy romance would be. Like this is the level of sex that I've found in like George R. R. Martin's books. It's used as power moves in a lot of places, especially in this book. I'm fine, like, there's a lot of it. <laughs> and there's not a lot of like the good, genuinely pleasurable sex that is between two consenting people that there is in She Who Became the Sun. Like She Who Became the Sun, we get to see, soft spoilers, Ma and Ju. It's lovely, it's so sweet. And it's this moment of Ma realizing Shu's biggest secret, right? that Shu is not biologically a man, has been hiding that fact for her entire life. The, the juxtaposition between that and we like, we get like the, just the gentle like shiver of it, get just like a whisper of it on the wind once. And we don't really get to see it as much as we have seen the more brutal use of sex with power. And I don't know, I find it incredibly interesting that that, that Shelley Parker Chan is deciding to do that. It's it's very interesting because we are not only seeing, we have not only seen up until this point, Bao Shan, one of the characters in here, who is more of an important character instead of just a side character in the previous book. And he becomes more of, a, of an important character. And I really am interested by the way that Shelley Parker Chan uses gender in these books because like it's it's set up very plainly with with Shu and with Ooyang in the first book the fact that Shu is born a girl but just takes her brother's fate and becomes him essentially throughout her life is a husband is married to Ma all this kind of stuff. Then on the flip side of that, Ooyang, who was made into a eunuch very young in his life and thus doesn't have a lot of the features that men do and is very feminine looking and is very visibly a eunuch and what that warrior life of Ooyang is and how angry he is. It's very like the the what what Shelley Parker Chan was doing with that in the first book was very interesting. And then what she's done taking it into this book is how Bao Shang is using his effeminate nature that is coming across and the fact that people I from my understanding they assume he's gay and because he's more effeminate, he's not as strong as his brother was, etc. etc. And he's kind of taken those rumors and it's like, fine, if you think I'm gay, good. I'm just going to be here ruining all of your lives. And Bao Shang uses his power in that, in being underestimated and in being believed to be lesser, to pull the strings. And he's using his, I don't know, his like 
power in that view and image of him to manipulate this third prince who is honestly a monster but someone who is so repressed and is trying to not feel all these like these um homosexual feelings that he's feeling Pashan, like he's he's pulling the strings in such an interesting way it's so interesting to me to have like another level of people in the focus of these books that aren't fitting in the gender cubes or gender boxes that we have set up and that this society has set up in this ancient world and it's fascinating to me because all of the men who so far have been very traditionally men, violent, warriors, the perfect specimens, etc, etc, who are very abusive to their wives, ta like taken that typical male view, all of the characters that we've seen with that have died and have just, you know, been erased. And it's these people who subvert the, the view of gender with Zhu and Ouyang and Baoshang who are still there and still pulling the strings because they understand what it is like to be disliked and to be overlooked. And it's so interesting to me. Like, I could talk for hours about Ouyang and Shu and how they are mirrors for each other and how these books are doing that. Because, for an example, they're like, because of what happens at the uh, near the end of She Became the Sun, so spoilers near the end where Ouyang in his mind thinks that the worst shame you can bring upon a person worse than death is to mutilate their body somehow which does kind of coincide with the belief of like in here like it's been mentioned a few times that people look upon Zhu who is now disabled because one of one of his arms is taken off and a lot of people can't like look upon Zhu at all or like spit upon them and like you know, all this kind of stuff. So it is a of a belief that like this mutilation of your God given body kind of a thing or your heaven, your heaven given body, your ancestral given body kind of a thing is, is abhorrent and shouldn't be done. And it is, is all this kind of stuff. So Ouyang, because Ouyang has also been mutilated and been like looked down upon his entire life. And that was the worst thing that has ever happened to him. Because of that, he says in, in his mind, he's like, all right, I am going to do this and it's going to be worse than dying a slow death. And he's going to wish for death, thinking of Shu. And Shu, the moment that Shu wakes up and Ma is there, like, being like, bitch, you, you scared us. Like, we could have lost you. Shu's smiling because Shu's like, this is the most in my body I have ever felt and most okay with myself I have ever felt. Like, this is almost a blessing to not have my arm anymore, even though it is incredibly difficult and, and Shu does have to like, you know, adjust to being now left-handed and can't do all this kind of stuff with, with two hands. And, and the fact that Ouyang thinks that that is the greatest pain he can bring upon Shu. And then when they meet up again in this book, there's this moment because Ouyang is fucking losing his shit in this. Like he doesn't, he doesn't quite grasp a lot of what propriety and like a lot of what the rules and the playing of these games are because he has been so just pushed aside his entire life he was a slave as a kid and then he was just working underneath his his the son of the king who killed his family kind of a thing he, his whole life has just been so so violent in this he is so broken he is so visibly broken too because even shu like after shu sees him in this like cell shu makes a comment him being Ouyang. She makes a comment that like before Shu could read all this pain on Ouyang because they have this like mandated connection because like like calls to like and they are so similar but now Shu can read it on Ouyang's face like he is so angry and so mad and so just ruined and you can read it on Ouyang's face because he's not hiding it anymore. There's this moment where because Shu takes him into kind of captivity and like you know makes a deal with him and all this kind of stuff and, and brings Ouyang over to their side because before he was a opposing general of the other side of the war. Shu takes his sword away and there's this moment where Ouyang feels as though he has lost a limb and he is taking it so much worse than when Shu actually lost a limb. He needs this sword because that is all he is. Because without his sword, he's just 
this man who is very looked down upon in this world and is treated like a woman would be like less than a woman even because he's a man who looks like a woman and all this kind of stuff like it is fascinating what Shelley Parker Chan is doing in these books I love it and then okay so last thing I'll say before this incredibly long update is, is over but so in the first book Zhu is the whole thing is Zhu is taking her fate like she is stealing somebody else's fate so it's this whole idea that heaven is something that doesn't that isn't all seeing which is something i was fascinated with the first time i read this because growing up around more of a christian faith like heaven is always all seeing you know like it, everything you do god knows or whatever the hell right and so coming from that to a to a belief that heaven is not always looking and you don't want to draw heaven's eye because then you can kind of live your life a little bit more chill and so Zhu in this in the first book decides of course to take her brother's fate because her brother was the one who was told to be great and she was the one who was told that she was going to be nothing but then her brother just gave up one day and died and so she was like bet i'm gonna take your fate bitch <laughs> and slowly just took this fate and made it her own so it's this it's this thing the idea that fate is something that you can take is so interesting to me and something that you can control like you can steal somebody else's fate what i don't know but then in here there's this comment Ouyang says, I flagged it because I was like, this is fucking fascinating. Like the fact that Ouyang is so unhinged in this book, he he's betrayed by someone at the beginning of this, which is what leads to his downfall and why he ends up being with, Shou, with Shu at one point. But he says, an emotion finally broke, or the narrator says, an emotion finally broke through Ouyang's headache. It was pure fury. Even if Xiao disagreed with his methods, it wasn't as if he was going to fail. How could you fail to achieve your fate? And I'm just like, okay. So the idea of fate in here, people believe that whatever they are destined to be, and he believes so strongly that his fate is to kill the Great Khan and like, you know, get revenge for what the Great Khan did to his family and to him. So the idea that fate is something that is predestined, that will happen no matter what you do, is like, and then there's also the flip side of it that Shu can steal fate because she just fucking wants to so badly. And then the fact that Shu and Ouyang are so similar, like calls to like, all this kind of stuff, that Shu is like, I have never met someone who di who has wanted as much as me and understands what it is to want and to take that fate, whatever I can do. So the idea that Weyoung is like, okay, cool, like no matter what I do, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna do my fate because it's fated, it's destined, there's nothing that can stop that. But then on the flip side, we have Zhu who stole someone else's fate. Oh, it's just so interesting. Like what is, what, can you fail in achieving your fate? Yes, is it is shown in the first book when Shu's brother, the original Shu Chongba, dies and gives up his greatness. And then Shu, our Shu, decided to put aside her nothing fate and become something great just because she fucking wants it. And then Ouyang says, no matter what I do, my fate will still happen. What's gonna happen in this book, guys? All these questions, they're making my brain go zzzz. <laughs> can't stop thinking about this book. I have been talking to you for 23 minutes about this story. I and I haven't even cracked the fucking surface of what's going on in these books. Like, oh my god, I could write essays on the gender play in this. And then on a total flip side of the coin, I could write essays about the religion in this and the the idea of fate and and and, and the tangibility of fate being something that people can steal, people can fail and taking their fate and it's not something that is predestined and ooh, the knowledge of knowing one's fate. All oh, these questions, ah. Anyways, I am uh, 230 pages in. I'm just gonna keep reading because it is just about 7.30ish, 7.20. I need to make dinner because I'm hungry. I'm gonna keep reading as I work on Christmas gifts around me. And I will let you know how I feel by the end of this book, but holy shit, man, Shirley Parker Chan, a master, a master at what they do. Gosh, it's so good. A few moments later. All right, I know it looks like I literally haven't moved and I haven't, but <laughs> I did eat dinner <laughs> since I last talked to you guys. And uh, I finished the whole freaking book. <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> I was sitting here and I was like, man, I need to talk to the vlog. I have so many thoughts. And now that I'm here, my brain is like, I don't know. First things first. I'm the realist. I finished my, the backing for this embroidery. It is now done with the twine for hanging. Wonderful, beautiful, one, amazing. I'm also working on this other embroidery. Why am I telling you that? This video is not my like regular vlog, but it, I guess some of you may care and I'm not working on the second sleeve. So I'm, I'm done being drawn the world. Okay, first thoughts. This was a fucking amazing book. It was so good. Second thoughts. This deserved to be a trilogy. And I'm kind of mad at Tor for making the decision to make this into a, into a duology when I remember seeing Shelley Parker Chan in an interview say it was supposed to be a trilogy from the beginning because they thought at the time that duologies would sell better. I'm mad at Tor for doing that because this whole trilogy would have been a fucking masterpiece if they had let it be a trilogy. It would have beat the poppy war out of the water. In my mind, it already does. This, this storytelling in She Who Became the Sun is so similar to the like historical storytelling of the poppy war. Like, if you like those books, read these because these are gonna blow you out of the water. They're so fucking good. But this deserved to be a trilogy because that ending was so rushed. I think even though this is like a fairly chunky book, like it ended up being almost 500 pages long, if Shelley Parker Chan had been given the opportunity to make this a trilogy, they would have crushed me mind, body, and soul because it felt so perfectly paced from top to bottom until we hit the 75% mark and then things started to just tumble forward like we were jumping time, jumping to places, jumping, jumping. And then we got to a point where I was like, wow, okay, so this isn't like the events leading up to this could have been a book on their own. And the fact that a lot of the reviews of this have been saying that the ending has was really rushed is just confirming my thoughts that either this needed to be another 200 pages longer or it needed to be its own book. It needed to be split into two because there's just so much here that needed that time to be what it needed to be. I, I wrote this whole thought process. I, I wrote, what an ending. Do I, do I like that Ju? And then spoilers, or is it the whole being spoilers? Cause I'm still, I'm like, I get it. I get what Shelly Parker Chan was trying to do at the end with Ju and like her whole gender thing and what she had to do at the end to achieve what she wanted. But I, but I wish that Ju didn't have to do that. I wish that Ju had, okay, spoilers, okay. Spoilers, 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 biggest spoilers for the literally the ending of this book. Mute me until the banner leaves if you don't wanna know, but okay, so the fact that Ju had to enter into this whole situation and infiltrate the great Khan's palace by being a woman, by becoming a woman again and debasing herself to nothing more than like a handmaid, not really debasing, but the fact that she went from being a radiant king to basically a slave who was cleaning the feet of the empress bothers me. The fact that she had to revert into this form that she was not comfortable being in at the end bothers me. And then I was like, okay, that's fine, whatever, we get it. It's a whole tactic because she can, you know, blend in where, where people are gonna least expect her to be because they know her to be a man. In the end, there's a moment where the Empress recognizes her because they've met before. And in that moment of Zhu standing up and looking her in the eyes, the Empress, and, and having the Empress say, Zhu's name, Zhu's chosen name. There's this moment of, of in the narrative where Zhu feels like herself again. Yeah, because it, in the end, like even Ma in here says that when she sees Zhu again after like they start their infiltration process, he, it's like it was uncanny that like the person that she'd known as Zhu had become two separate people. Like the idea of her husband that she knew and then this like meek servant girl in front of her. So it was like a, like a Zhu just like tore herself from her herself for a little bit. And then in that recognition, in the use of her name, she came back to herself. And that's the moment of the downfall, essentially the start of the downfall, which also didn't take enough time. The fa and it was too easy. It was too easy of a downfall in the end, even though Ma gave up her bodily autonomy for it, even though it, it took like a month in time, like the actual last scene where Zhu becomes emperor, the great Khan, literally, and names, a new, names the new dynasty is too 
easy because homie great con what's his full name i keep writing him as bao in my notes and i keep not using his whole goddamn name what's his whole name bao shang bao shang he wanted too much and he wanted too much to be taken down by one month with a woman who made him feel loved like that's it like it, there's no way it was so easy and the fact that he just chose to give up his mandate and not become emperor or not be and not remain emperor at that point in time too easy it was too easy of an ending and the fact that we get it literally on the last page so that bothered me a little bit which i don't think is shelly parker chan's fault i think it's the constraint of a duology's fault i think that they needed a third book to do this story its full justice even though this book was still a fucking masterpiece like the gender talks that i've talked at length already about the use of pain of sex and of power in this book in so many different ways i could study for days on end especially with uyang like oh my god uyang his storyline was perfect and painful and <laughs> yeah this needed to be a trilogy this deserved to be a trilogy because I think that there is a very clear spot where Shelley Parker Chan could have split this. The the like the moment in Zhu's big climactic fight with or like the fight with the fleet, that derailment and having to go after the fleet could have been fleshed out a little bit more, lengthened just a little bit more, and that could have been the ending. The moment of that grief and that breaking and that the fact that that was the moment that Zhu realized how much pain that what she has been doing to other people can put people in and like that that realization of bringing together the pain and the grief and the realization of what you're doing and then we could have started book three from that moment the race to the throne essentially trying to like beat Uyang to the great Khan and then having this whole moment be much better fleshed out have more moments of like gentleness with the characters because there wasn't a lot of like character like this is all very character driven <laughs> don't get me wrong but there there i even wrote at one point i've missed Zhu's internal deliberation because i didn't realize how little we were getting of it this go around this moment of Zhu just on her own thinking things through Zhu is so smart and this moment like i it was on two page page 284 like the fact that what she's thinking through ends up becoming wrong, it was a red herring, is buried in everything else. And it's not, like that could have been a huge plot twisty moment in this book, but it was buried because we just had to get to the end so fast. And I think, and I, I we had to get to the end and that's like this far into the book, but like that's, that's the thing. Like, I think this deserved to be a trilogy. I'm just gonna keep saying that. Like, these these books are fucking brilliant and the conversations that they're having with power and gender and um, wars and love and belonging and loneliness and all of these different themes like they're fucking brilliant and the historical retelling of the creation of the Ming dynasty is so cool like it's such an interesting place in history to examine and also to make into a fantasy book because there's magic in here in my head right now I am peeling this story apart and like placing it in a better format for like book two raising the stakes like crazy having these plot twists betrayals bing bang boom and then having the fleet be the end the fleet moments be the end and then the start of the downfall of the con in the next one that would have been groundbreaking earth shattering tor why did you make this a duology <laughs> this would have been a perfect trilogy i think it would have been perfect it would have been a perfect five star tr trilogy if tor had let it be a trilogy I still really enjoyed the reading experience of this. And honestly, I gotta say, when I got to the point of the culmination of Ouyang's storyline, I was sitting here screaming quietly uh, to as to not disturb my neighbors. I was sitting here just like, this is a five-star book. Like up until that point, I was like, this is five stars. Even though I could feel the rush of the end, the culmination of the Ouyang storyline is so masterfully perfectly done. Like Ouyang's story, I wouldn't have changed a thing. That man is a shell of himself. Everything that happened at the end, yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, if I, you know, could decide the man's fate myself, I would have uh, changed up a little bit. But I like, I would have made a little happier at the end. But, <laughs> but I like the image of 
Ouyang being so ripped apart at the end. Like, so much so that he can't even feel physical pain. He looks down at himself and he realizes that he's bleeding from multiple wounds that he didn't even know he had. And he is so wrecked by this fate that he is trying to claim. And then it's over. And it's so mundane in the way that it's over. And the fact that he becomes this thing that then Zhu can use. That whole ending sequence needed more. It needed more meat. It needed, it needed more. <laughs> we needed another 200 pages just to give the ending enough time. Again, <laughs> I'm not even mad at Shelly Parker Tan because Shelly did it as best as they could within the constraints of a duology. Like, like, I wonder honestly how long their original draft was of this. If it was that like 200 pages extra and they were told to edit it down. Like, I wonder how much has been taken out of this because it feels like someone outside of the author had like to reach in and wrenched it smaller and tighter. You know, like I I will read literally anything else that Shelley Parker Chan publishes at this point. They have become a autobi author with two books. This is such a good book. This is still getting like four, four and a half stars. Like it's so fucking good. It deserved to be absolutely amazing, you know? If you've read this book, you, you, tell me if you feel the same way. Like, if you've read this duology, if you've come to the end of it, tell me if you feel the same way that it deserved more. It deserved more space. And I know that would have been weird having, like, even if, if you wanted to keep it as a duology, fine. Even if we had to add the 200 pages to this to make it, like, a fully perfect story, it would have been so unbalanced because She Who Became the Sun, which is currently on my shelves, is thinner than this still. So having like a thinner book than that and then a bigger book than that like it just every time I see a, a series that is imbalanced like that it, it makes me wonder like how much of it was in the author's hands and how much of it was construed by the team around the book and that brings into the whole question of like how much power do editors and agents and the, the teams and publishers in traditional publishing has I don't know because I'm not traditionally published and a lot of, you know, a lot of the teams behind traditionally published books are absolutely iconic and amazing and they are here to make the books the best they can be. But I think sometimes they do step on the author's abilities, sometimes. And I think that's what was happening here. I'm just gonna keep saying it. It feels like the author did the best that they could do with what constraints they had. And I hate that. <laughs> I could be so wrong. And it could be something that Shelley Parker Chan decided to do themselves and, and have the ending like that. But it doesn't feel that way. It feels like something was pushed, shoved and squished to make it fit better. This should have been a fucking trilogy. <laughs> I'm so mad about it. But it was so good and I'm so glad I read it and I just moved everything forgetting that I have an embroidery needle hanging from a sweater. <laughs> oh god. I'm gonna grab the the first book and we'll do the outro. <laughs> okay so this <laughs> this duology is so good and I'm so glad that I did read it and I'm <sighs> I'm gonna be <laughs> Thinking about the fact that this needed to be a trilogy forever. Now, this is gonna, I'm not gonna be able to stop thinking about this duology for such a long time because of the mastery and storytelling that was in here and how much better it would have been <laughs> if it had been given the space that it needed to be given. As I said, guys, these books, four and a half star books. This duology is a four and a half star duology for me. Like I can tell right now that this book is a four and a half star despite the ending. So the story that we do have, this wonderful story, this brutal, dark story is so worth your time. If you have been thinking about it, pick it up. It's so good. If you liked The Poppy War, pick this up because this is even better in my opinion. I liked The Poppy War enough. The third book absolutely fucking tanked and was bad for me, but first two books were pretty good. These ones, to me, do the historical fantasy war thing better. But that's not to say that these are bad. Like, I gave The Poppy War four stars and The Dragon Republic four and a half stars and then this one, like, two stars. But <laughs> these, these are both four and a half star books and that's incredible. That's incredible. And I am not gonna be able to shut up about this book. So I hope you're ready for me to complain about it for a while and also be absolutely in love with it for a while because Shelley Parker Chan created such a beautiful, heart-wrenching, intense story with these two books. Oh my God, what a, what a mastery of storytelling. I am so excited to see what they are working on next. 
because if this is any indication of where they're beginning with their fantasy career, where the shit are we gonna go from here, you know? I honestly don't know. This is already masterful, masterful fantasy. This is up there with the works of N.K. Jemisin. This is up there with the works of like John freaking Gwynn. I'm just, <laughs> of S.A. Shaka Borti. Like these people are masters of their craft and Shelley Parker Chan is sitting up there with them. Like, <sighs> tours out of the building. I'm gonna speak directly to Shelley Parker Chan because of course they're watching this fucking video. Of course. <laughs> Shelly, thank you for this incredible masterwork. Thank you for sharing this story. Thank you for creating such incredible character arcs and bringing up interesting discussions and questions about history and fate and gender and identity and love and everything. These books are so fucking good. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know what to do with myself now. Anyways, friends, all right, that's the end of this video. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Let me know down below if, you, if you've if you read these books and if you're excited for series series number six, which is gonna be coming at some point. Uh, it's gonna be Foundry Side by Robert Jackson Bennett. Let me get the book. It's gonna be this trilogy. I have the second book for my library right now. So in January, when I can, when I'm done a lot of the books that I have on my TBR, I will be diving into Foundry Side. So stick around, make sure to subscribe if you're not already subscribed. And let me know down below if there are any other series that you wanna see me do this type of video for because I will take your suggestions. <laughs> I will. I promise I will. I will catch you in another video very, very soon. What is on me? I don't even know at this point. Let me just do this so you can't see the grossness of my sweater. <laughs> I'll catch you in another one very, very soon. Stay kind and keep on reading.